I think we're live. Okay, I think we can get started. Hello, everyone. I'm Krista from Climate Kick. Thank you for joining us live from all over the world today. We are uh, just setting up, so please bear with us while we make the connection on LinkedIn Live.
Um, Oh, there we go. All righty. Sorry to keep everybody waiting. I think we are now officially live, so we can get started with our session. I'm Krista from EIT Climate Kick. Thanks for joining from all over the world. This is day one of our annual week of action, which means from now until Monday, we have about a dozen live sessions planned, just like this one, that will offer some insights on the many projects uh, that Climate Kick is working on, our climate change initiatives that we are leading on with the support of our knowledge and communicate and <laughs> innovation community. And so for this session, uh, my colleague Ayub will be moderating an exciting panel with several of our partners working in the Africa innovation space. But before we get there, uh, Ayub will set the stage by giving us a quick rundown of the current African entrepreneurship ecosystem. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Krista, and uh, welcome to everybody to the first day of the, the Climate Week of Action from Climate Kick. And I'm really excited to talk to you uh, today about uh, our different initiatives in, uh, in Africa, give you a little bit of background from the report that we've just uh, published recently, and uh, very excited to welcome some of our partners uh, during this, uh, this panel. So, uh, as you know, Climate Kick is an innovation agency, and we've been focused on the African continent for the last uh, five years, especially with our entrepreneurship programs. Today, we have programs in around 20 countries across, across the, the, the continent, and we thought it was the right time for us to gather some of the learnings that we had uh, working with different partners from the continent, from incubation partners, universities, uh, investors, and the different startups with whom we work across the continent. So we published in September uh, a report called Adapt, Mitigate and Grow, a climate tech, tech innovation in, uh, in Africa. And I would like to show just a little bit of some of the insights to open up this, uh, this panel and then uh, move on to the discussion with the different uh, panelists. 
So a first uh, reminder uh, when we talk about uh, climate in, uh, in Africa is the, the, the continent is the one that is emitting the least uh, in, in the world. Unfortunately, it is the continent that is suffering the, 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 the most. And uh, we can see it in the different maps um, below, but the continent is uh, suffering from, from uh, climate. And there are many climate risks uh, in, in stake here. Um, there is water scarcity across the, the, the continent with a lot of different regions that are severely under water stress. The agricultural yields uh, are uh, decreasing and uh, the soils are being deteriorated in several uh, regions, uh, desertic regions, obviously the Sahel, but, uh, but others. But in the same time, uh, there are high risk of, of disasters and floods. And we have seen it in, uh, in September, unfortunately, after the, the floods in, uh, in um, Pakistan, there were 17 countries across Africa that were severely damaged with more than 100,000 displaced people across the, the, the continent. And in the same time with this climate crisis, there is a big uh, lack of access to energy across the, the continent with around 600 million people that do not have access to, uh, to the energy grids. So all these different uh, aspects are increasing dramatically the, the, the risk of having population displacement, as I mentioned, uh, due to floods, to droughts, uh, etc. But in the same time, we would like to look at Africa as a land of, of high potential when we talk about climate innovation. And for different reasons here, just to mention a, a few, we really see the continent as having a really strong competitive advantage in terms of climate innovation. And just uh, as an example, when we look at uh, renewable energy, uh, we believe that really the narrative has to be changed when we talk about the, the continent, because most of the time, people around the world are talking about Africa as being a land of uh, resources, such as fossil fuel. But if we compare these resources with the potential that the continent has in terms of renewable energy, uh, the potential is much la larger. And uh, when we talk about uh, renewable uh, solar energy, obviously, is, is, is by far the, the, the one with the highest potential, with 10 terawatt uh, potential, but as well as uh, hydro energy, wind energy, and geothermal uh, as well. The forecasted installed capacity in uh, renewable energy is 310 gigawatts by uh, 2030. But we really believe that uh, renewable energy is just one example uh, of climate innovations, but the potential is much larger than, than that when we look at the, the full scope of climate uh, innovation. On top of that, we believe that the high growth of the private sector is, will be a key driver in the boost of uh, cl climate innovation across the, the, the continent and also the potential of a really large addressable market that today is still untapped. Um, in the same time, we really see as an exciting time today for uh, the, the, the climate space, because in 2021, the continent has dramatically increased the number of investments towards uh, startups and the climate space is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is taking more and more a growing uh, stage in, uh, in the in this startups investment in, uh, in general. We've looked at the investment uh, attracted by climate startups uh, from 2015 till, uh, till today and we had a, a more than $2 billion attracted uh, by, uh, by climate uh, startups. Just in 2021, $440 million were, um, were raised by, uh, by climate startups. And just three uh, key insights before moving to the, the, the panel. The first one is we really believe that climate technology needs to come and solve a local problem. And uh, we really need to foster locally grown solutions. We've talked a lot about renewable energy, and that is what is driving the most the, the climate space in, in general. But we really see the potential to solve local issues such as the cold chain, um, clean cooking, etc., by, by using the, the, the clean techs. 
The second thing is a geographical disparity, because when we talk about the continent, we're talking about 54 countries. And uh, uh, the attraction of, of, of funding is uh, unequal across the, the continent. Having Kenya and Nigeria being the main drivers of, of, of this growth, Kenya has attracted, for example, 56% of, of the total investments and Nigeria 23%. The second geographical disparity is that we see that most of these funds are coming from outside uh, uh, Africa. More than 50% uh, of, of, of the volume is coming from outside the, the continent. So the Africans that are capable actually of uh, opening a, a, a branch or a holding in, in other countries are the ones that are attracting the most um, the, the most investment. And the last one is we really believe that there is insufficient dedicated support to climate startups. Across the continent, there are more or less 650 innovation hubs, and only 4% of those are fully dedicated to, uh, to, to climate. So uh, those are just a few of the, of the insights. You're welcome to read the full report. But I would like to welcome now uh, my, my panelists just to have, have a, a brief intro of who they are, what they do, their link with, the, with, with Climate Kick before opening up to the discussion. So first of all, I would like to welcome uh, Jad uh, Bouhmouche, uh, which is coming from the investor co community. Uh, hello, Jad. Hi, Yub. Good to be here. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, about you, about Ambo Venture, and uh, and yeah, opening remarks maybe. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm Jade. Um, I'm one of the uh, co-founders of Ambo Ventures. We invest in African entrepreneurs who are tackling uh, climate change um, in a way that's commercially competitive. Um, and um, I've had essentially kind of like a, the uh, immense kind of pleasure to actually contribute to this report. Um, and one of the elements that we ultimately highlighted is that because of the nature of innovation on the continent, um, because of the challenges that a lot of entrepreneurs face, and because of just um, the competing priorities, many of the climate entrepreneurs have to actually create uh, companies that um, are immediately commercially competitive with polluting incumbents. And that is actually a really interesting and um, potentially powerful uh, kind of aspect of innovation, um, which um, we'll continue to talk about afterwards. Um, and sure. there's a lot of good examples in kind of the uh, uh, kind of a demo day, um, which you actually created as well. So um, congrats on actually aggregating in all these amazing companies. Welcome to this panel and thanks a lot for, uh, for, for the valuable uh, contribution. I would like to welcome now uh, Eunice uh, from Impact Hub Lusaka from Zambia. Hello, Eunice. Hi, I, uh, I'm glad to be part of this uh, forum. Um, so my name is Eunice Yakachoma. I'm coming from Impact Hub Lusaka. I'm the executive director there. So our first journey generally with uh, Climate Kick was when we launched and became the first partner in implementing the Climate Launchpad program, which was the first ever in Zambia of the kind. And so it broke the records as we are trying to endeavor to pursue the idea of climate um, change activities. And I'm just excited to be part of this discussion. Welcome, Eunice, and great to hear from the Climate Launchpad uh, initiative in, uh, in Zambia. Uh, I would like to welcome now uh, Prabhakar from Kenya uh, Climate Innovation Center. Hello, Prabhakar. Hi, Ayub, and a pleasure to be here uh, on this fantastic uh, innovative uh, initiatives that uh, Climate Kick has taken. So just to introduce myself, my name is Prabhakar Vanam. I'm the CEO of KCAC Consulting. KCAC Consulting and the larger KCAC group uh, have been at the forefront of designing and implementing many climate change programs across Kenya, as well as in Africa. Over the years, uh, we at KCAC Group uh, have helped over 1,800 innovations across Africa, be it in the mitigation space as well as in the adaptation space, which has directly resulted in providing more than 18,000 full-time equivalent jobs. And we are very happy to also report that, you know, out of this 18,000 full-time jobs, 43% uh, have, have been 
for women jobs. And we've been extremely successful in mitigating tons of CO2 as well. A uh, couple of things that we do at KCIC, commercialization is something that we always stress upon. It's a DNA and we are, uh, all the innovations that we have supported, 63% have been commercially successful. We also have another unit called Kenya Climate Ventures, which also does investments uh, into the growth stage enterprises. We've been partnering with Climate Cake and a very uh, uh, rewarding uh, partnership with Climate Cake. Uh, it dates back to many years where we have done the climate launch pad across Africa as well as in Kenya. We are currently implementing two good programs with Climate Cake. One is on the Wood Architect Rock Stars, where we are doing both Climathon as well as Journey. Climathon just ended and Journey is currently ongoing as we speak. And we are also happy to launch the A and R Adaptation and Resilience Program, which is aimed to identify some innovative adaptation innovations across Africa. Pleasure to be here and happy to interact with the audiences this afternoon. Welcome, Prabhakar, and very exciting time in, uh, in Kenya with the, uh, I guess it's super busy time for you. Uh, and last but not least, I would like to welcome Mejda from uh, Tunisia. Uh, who was one of the beneficiaries of the program Africa Clean Accelerator. Hello, Mejda. Hi. Good to have Hello, you. Hello, everyone. So thank you so much for inviting me to this panel. It's my pleasure. So uh, I'm Mejda Khaled. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Agero. Uh, I've been selected through the Africa Climate Accelerator with the Climate Cake uh, in the program, which uh, we, we had like four months of acceleration program. And uh, finally, with uh, an amazing uh, training and coaching sessions and one-on-ones, it was so beneficial to our business, which is what's Agero. Uh, we do recycling and upcycling of uh, textile waste, solid waste, etc., and we turn it into uh, new products from fashion, decor, accessories in collaboration with artists and designers, basically now in Tunisia. So the Africa Climb Accelerator uh, was, uh, was our boost uh, to start and kick off to uh, new markets, let's say, and uh, to kick also another uh, type or um, B2B part of our business uh, through all, also uh, the grant that we received from the program. So uh, that's, that's us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you for uh, for, for being you. part of uh, of this panel, and uh, we were really happy to have you uh, among the the, the batch of uh, of the Africa Clean Accelerator. Very exciting um, platform, and uh, and really look forward to see your products uh, not only in Tunisia but but even uh, even abroad. So I, I would like to uh, open up this uh, discussion with a question to um, to uh, Jad uh, about. Um, the uh, climate investment space uh, in, uh, in in Africa, and as I mentioned, there was an, a dramatic exponential growth of investments and a lot of interest from investors around the world um, uh, on on the African continent. And I would like to have your point of view on how do you see the the space? How can you explain this the, the, this trend? And what brought you as an investor? to um, get interested in Africa and in the climate space, particularly in, in Africa. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, as an African, um, I actually care quite a bit about what's happening on the continent. Um, there's um, a tremendous opportunity, I think, um, as we effectively look at kind of um, what do we on the continent actually have, right? Like you point, it's all of the effectively kind of like um, uh, kind of energy resources, the natural resources, right? We have on the continent a tremendous amount of effectively capability to be able to tap into the local environment, to be able to actually tap into traditions as well of actually living in harmony with nature and other aspects to be able to come up with really interesting, innovative approaches. Um, the other aspect is, I mean, um, we're on track to eclipse um, all the uh, um, uh, aggregates, effectively climate investment that we've had last year. So we're already at 4.2 essentially billion dollars in uh, kind of like investments into Africa. Um, there's a tremendous amount of interest, primarily because people are beginning to realize that the type of innovation that we're coming up with isn't just Africa focused, right? Isn't just for here. Here is an amazing starting point. It's a challenging starting point, as any entrepreneur will uh, undoubtedly agree. But the way that we innovate, the way that we are able to take existing technologies, new technologies, 
the way that we're able to bring them together in a way that's cost competitive, in a way that's commercially viable, in a way that is actually in harmony with the environment that we're operating in, can also be applied in other parts of the world, right? In the US, in EU, in China, in India, and elsewhere. Um, the other aspect is you talked about Africa as effectively kind of a growing market. Um, I mean, look at effectively the population, right? We're continuing to grow at an extremely kind of advanced rate. Um, and within the overall population, actually, we have more than almost anywhere else, a closer tie to um, effectively kind of like the land and nature. Agriculture still represents the overwhelming uh, components of most African, essentially kind of like um, uh, 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 GDP, which means that we're much more tied into the effects of climate change as well which means that the kinds of innovations that we're coming up with aren't just kind of hypothetical ideas in a lab because of um, essentially kind of a movie that we saw, right? This is real world. This is our daily lives. This is the experience that we have. And if you're dealing with it every single day, you're significantly more likely to come up with an idea that's probably going to be relevant and applicable in that particular context. Um, there's extraordinary entrepreneurs in uh, Kenya, Egypt, uh, Casablanca, and Morocco, right, who are all tackling these kinds of issues around water, uh, Tunisia as well, Mijta, right? I mean, like, there's there's really, really interesting kind of, um, uh, uh, kind of opportunities. Now, the last element that to me is kind of perhaps actually changed over the last effectively eight to 10 years is um, we've had... Uh, well, effectively eight, eight years ago, we were talking about essentially kind of uh, all the talent was leaving Africa, right? So everyone kind of was leaving to go elsewhere. Well, now people are coming back. <laughs> and what that means is they're actually bringing back capital. They're bringing back skills. They're bringing back talent and knowledge, right? And this influx of individuals who have had experience elsewhere, but who ultimately are trying to make an impact at home is also beginning to propagate. And then you have the local entrepreneurs who essentially never actually left um, to continue to grow. Um, so I've run on a little bit, but hopefully that gives you an idea of my view. Sorry. No, thanks. Th thanks a lot for the, the broad overview across the, the continent. But I would like to focus now on the Kenyan case. And um, as mentioned before, it's the country that has attracted most of uh, of, of the investment. So we'd like to hear from you, uh, Prabhakar, if you can tell us a little bit about the Kenyan experience and how can you explain uh, maybe the success of the, of, of the country re relatively to others in the, in the continent? Thanks, Ayub. And I just wanted to take it from where Jade has actually left out. He did mention that there are plenty of opportunities. So why is that the opportunities are not able to get converted across Africa? As we all know, Africa, as you said, Ayub, it's a 54 countries that we are talking about, and each country has its own ecosystem. Few countries have done fantastically well. Few countries are way lagging behind. So what is that that has worked for Kenya? So Kenya, obviously, as everybody might be knowing, is a dominant country in the East Africa region. I mean, it has 50% plus contribution to the GDP. So that's something that is really working well. The issue of finances in Kenya is addressed at a multiple level. I mean, there is government on one side, there is private sector on the other side. We have a very robust private sector that is working in Kenya, which is really helping uh, uh, in ensuring that, you know, the finances are coming through. There was a study in 2018, which we were very, uh, we, we were part of along with CPI, which we did. And that study mentioned that uh, there was $2.4 billion that was spent on climate related activities in Kenya alone and of which around 40% was drawn from the private sector, both national as well as international, which shows the robustness of the private sector in Kenya, which obviously needs to grow much beyond, but at least there's a fantastic starting point in terms of what private sector has been able to do. Couple of things that has really worked in Kenya, uh, the, the regulatory environment has been really well, uh, really good. Uh, very recently, um, uh, Central Bank of Kenya has issued a guideline uh, ensuring financial institutions to be climate resilient uh, in terms of what they need to do in terms of improving their loan, green portfolios and those kind of things. And uh, recently, Nairobi saw a security exchange, which is one of the only six security exchange, I think, in the continent of Africa, has mandated all the listed companies uh, uh, in Kenya 
to declare their sustainability reporting, which shows that you know their commitments towards the com towards the environment and various things. Couple of uh, uh, things again, uh, Kenya's youth population, we should never ignore it. 75% of the population in Kenya is youth, which means they are more adopt in terms of uh, embracing the technologies. Uh, M-Pesa has been innovated here, but uh, people have access to mobile technologies, mobile internet. So they are very uh, well informed in terms of what's happening and they're able to embrace that access to information that they are able to have in terms of piloting some innovations at their level. A uh, couple of last examples. Um, uh, we recently have held, uh, we were part of the Mobile World Con Congress that happened in Kigali just recently. And some stunning numbers came out of that uh, conference. FinTech obviously is growing a lot. Ayub, you did mention 61% uh, uh, 60, or 60% 60 of uh, funds raised in Africa was from Kenyan entrepreneurship. Uh, the fintech sector accounted for 27% of the number of deals closed and which was around $2.7 billion kind of thing. So there is amazing ecosystem around fintech and all those things that is happening. And uh, uh, there are uh, uh, another, another interesting thing that's happening in Kenya is having these incubators and accelerators around who are able to handhold the uh, startups as well as um, uh, uh, as well as growth stage enterprises. Just to give one example, at KCIC, we helped a company called Exotic EPZ. It's a very small company involved in buying and producing uh, climate resilient uh, fruits. Uh, uh, this was way back uh, and based on the capacities, the mentorship, the incubation that she gone through, very recently, a month ago or 15 days ago, Ayub, uh, USA ID has provided them a grant of a million dollars to upscale their businesses. So those things are, uh, I mean, there are a few examples, Ayub, I don't know whether I could answer your, uh, respond to your question, but those are a few things that are happening well in Kenya. But yeah, great to hear from, from your experience and I'm really excited to have uh, people from a di diverse, uh, diverse places. So I would like to uh, go to you now, now Eunice, and, and maybe have the perspective from, uh, from Zambia. How do you perceive uh, the Zambian ecosystem uh, and specifically in the in the climate space. Okay, so I, I want to pro perhaps start from something to do with policy direction. Mm -hmm. We just had um, um, a new president altogether, that is end of last year. And the first pronouncement perhaps is what was a major game changer because upon appointment of cabinet and the ministries, everybody was excited to know what ministries will be put in, in place to ensure that we attain a number of things, among them job creation that has been a call to many youths in our country. And the first pronouncement that made a lot of excitement in the country is that of having a green economy ministry. That was a big, big deal for Zambia. And I know that came way after our climate launch pad uh, initiative, but I think it's, um, it was a place where our people and the team that we trained through the climate launch pad cl uh, program that we did with Climate Kick together are now beneficiaries of this particular uh, ministry. As I speak to you upon the, uh, the selection of that ministry, we have now a lot of deliberate policies that are being put in place. The ecosystem is changing altogether because now there's a ministry to spearhead activities along um, attainment of a, a green economy. So. Uh, yesterday on the news, it was quite interesting and exciting that many banks and private sector government agencies have come on board to support this particular activity. So if you can ask me, the future is green in Zambia, the future is green and we are excited and we want to do more and more because now we have um, uh, a government and a ministry that is directly responsible for these activities. And so far, the president made a clear pronouncement because the, the major challenge we had is the cutting down of trees because the livelihood of more, many Zambians were based on uh, nature. And because they are based on nature, activities, you find that we were so prone to negative effects of climate change. And so we are just excited. We have just started. I wouldn't really say something is happening for now. We are in transit and we're in the process of attaining green. So I say the future is green for Zambia and we are ready. 
great to hear uh, Eunice and uh, really happy to hear that the government is actually quite active in the in, in the space and its uh, development and as we mentioned in the in, in the report in order for a successful development of, of an ecosystem obviously we need a lot of entrepreneurs innovators obviously we need uh, entrepreneurship support organization to, uh, to to drive them them we need a thriving um, investor uh, community as well uh, active and obviously we need uh, a government that is uh, active and and supporting the development of uh, of regulation that uh, that benefit to the, the the innovators i would like to go back to you uh, jad and uh, specifically about the technologies and innovations, what are the most exciting trends that, that, that you see in terms of the technologies uh, going and, and developing the continent? Yeah, I mean, um, so there's a couple of areas that we are particularly interested in. Um, we invested into Rome in uh, Kenya um, in the EV space. Um, transportation, logistics, mobility, right? Like how do we actually get um, in a much more kind of environmentally sustainable way, people and goods um, to the places where ultimately they actually need to go. And how do we actually make that um, more um, commercially compelling um, than kind of what already exists? Um, there's tremendous uh, um, uh, effectively opportunities all across that chain. Um, with the actual production of EVs in Kenya, in actual countries, all the way up to, you know, why don't we have African EV batteries? We have all the raw materials, right? Everything is here, and yet most of it is being exported and then brought back as uh, kind of like a battery. Why don't we have local production? Um, all of that continues to be important to be able to produce and to continue. Um, on the other end, right, we also kind of like invested into a company in Egypt, Atrify, um, which is actually kind of like in the plastic space, right? They've actually developed a mechanism to be able to produce a plastic that is entirely biodegradable, is petrochemical free, and is actually cheaper than plastic. Um, that's incredible, right? I mean, these are the kinds of innovations that can have a transformative effect all over the world, right? Um, it's these kinds of areas where there's tremendous opportunity to progress, to grow. Um, we also quite like everything around essentially blue tech and water in agriculture as well. We think there's a lot to be done, um, particularly as we look at, you know, how do we use new tiles of, effective, um, of effectively technology, bring down the average effectively kind of price point and allow kind of the 300 million smallholder um, actual producers to be able to access the kinds of technologies and techniques that they need to become a bit more effectively climate um, uh, kind of aware in their production methods. Um, there's a whole lot more that I don't know yet because every single day we have opportunities and entrepreneurs who come to us with ideas that I would have never imagined would be possible. Um, and that's what's to me the most exciting aspect of actually innovation on the continent is um, pretty much every day there's a person who comes and what you thought was impossible, they tell you that actually they've done it. So, um, yeah, this is exciting, but no, thanks for, uh, for, for the, these feedbacks. And, uh, yeah, I mean, w w we see it all the time. Most of the time when we, people think about, uh, about the climate space, the first thing that comes to mind is renewable energies, uh, mitigation in, uh, in general, but we see l such a large, um, scope and, uh, s s such a large, uh, kind of, of innovations coming from the, the, the continent that are actually solving, uh, uh, local problems today uh, renewable are attracting most of the investments but the space is quite is, is quite big to, um, to to tap into adaptation is a big space I think that uh, that has to be uh, developed now I'm curious about um, what are the main barriers uh, that um, that um, entrepreneurs are, are, are facing uh, and I would like here to have the opinion of uh, of uh, everybody maybe in the in, in the panel and maybe starting with you Prabhakar. Oops, trying to figure out the video. Thank you yes. so much for that very interesting question, uh, IU. Uh, <clears throat> I would basically put, uh, based on our experiences of supporting the enterprises in this uh, part of the world, I basically put the problems to the of the SMEs and MSMEs into five different buckets. 
The first one being access to finance. I mean, uh, Jade here has been mentioning about opportunities, but if you go on the other side of the spectrum and see what are your problems, they would obviously say access to finance because the mapping of uh, uh, funders having the finance and the projects wanting to have finance is huge. So access to finance comes to comes from various uh, uh, various different models, I guess. Uh, depending on the stage of the enterprise, uh, whether it is a startup, the requirements of the access to finance or the funding requirements is different. When they are in the growth stage, the funding requirements are absolutely different. And unfortunately, although uh, Africa is still evolving, Africa, we do say that, you know, startup is able to generate so much revenues uh, in the continent. But there are so many startups in this part of the world who are really struggling because of the uh, perception that the funding agencies have, that the investor community has about these startups. So that obviously being one of the big, big problems that we need to unlock. Second is the uh, lack of uh, uh, capacities or lack of uh, access to business advisory services, as we call it. Uh, many enterprises, especially if they are at the growth stage, they come in with an idea. That's all they have. Now, how do we convert this ideator to an entrepreneur uh, is the real challenge that we uh, we all face and that's where I think this business advisory services, access to technical skills, access to uh, uh, training, capacity building does come in. Uh, and when, when it comes to business advisory services, it has to be no holds barred approach. Doesn't matter what the enterprise needs uh, based on the needs assessment that you do, you should be able to provide a very comprehensive, uh, 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 comprehensive capacities. Uh, we had an example here, uh, Ayub in Kenya, where we where there wasn't this enterprise who was wanting to get trained or wanting to use block technology in their uh, in their supply chain. So, if you stop that and say that you know we are unable to provide this, there goes a business model which which may not be able to translate into a next level kind of a thing. So that's number two. Number three would be access to information. Uh, although we do say so much of revolution happening in terms of technology, but at the same time, uh, Jade is here struggling to identify projects, but here are the uh, entrepreneurs who are struggling to identify the innovators, uh, the funders like Jade. So there has to be some amount of access to information and there is a lot of uh, uh, role that climate kick kind of organizations have to play, KCIC kind of organizations have to play in ensuring that this information is disseminated to the people, especially living in the rural part of the uh, rural part of the world, uh, to ensure that they have this information, not just about the uh, finance, but also about the pricing, but also about the networking events that they can attend, which also opens up access to markets kind of a thing. The fourth thing would be access to facilities. As I said, uh, these guys have ideas. Now, how do we prototype these ideas into something workable? Uh, there needs to be some kind of access to facilities. Uh, be it uh, technical facilities, be it some simple office spaces for you to come and use the internet kind of a thing. That's the fourth thing. And the last one, which uh, my co-panelist uh, Eunice was also mentioning, is about policy. Uh, there has to be some kind of enabling environment for you to import, export kind of a thing for your products and services. And it shouldn't be an impediment, rather it should be a facilitating process. And that's where I think a lot of advocacy needs to be done. So those are the five broad problems uh, the enterprises or the SMEs uh, are kind of facing, uh, especially in this part of the world, Ayub. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Prabhakar. Yeah, uh, it would be good to hear from uh, an investor point of view on this, uh, this question. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would echo a lot of what you actually um, um, uh, effectively talked about, right? I mean, like, we have more pipeline than we can actually invest in, right? As in, like, we have more opportunities today than we have capital to invest. Um, and that continues to be kind of a reality. Um, local VCs get a tiny proportion of the capital that's allocated to the continent. The vast majority of the capital actually goes to um, typically kind of non-African VCs and non-African essentially owners of capital. And there's a challenge there, right? If you want more local founders to be backed, to be supported, then provide capital to local investors who are in those networks, right? Provide capital to local organizations who are able to, uh, kind of like as you talked about, right, to actually essentially get these organizations ready for investment, who are able to actually bring them to the networking events that the local investors are at, right? Like all of these things. Um, there's a chain of ultimately consequences and kind of reality that actually means that um, it is 
challenging if you're a local entrepreneur to one, actually be taken in kind of a credible way to, to know who to talk to, right? Um, within our pipeline, we've made a concerted effort to really tap into local networks. And that's been kind of a journey, right? I mean, when we initially started, all, quite a lot of the referrals that we got, quite a lot of the introductions that we got were to kind of expats, right? And then it wasn't until I started to speak to people kind of in Morocco at home, you know, all these things that you eventually get through to different connections, to different contacts, uh, Kenya as well, right? It's, it's, you have to actually be there. You have to understand what's happening. You have to understand what the context is. And ultimately you have to be able to add meaningful value. Um, me as an investor, I'm not going to be able to provide all of the capital that a startup is going to need or all of the essentially networks and introductions and skills. You need more than that. You need others who are going to be involved. Um, and especially as kind of a local investor, we have a responsibility to do more than just write a check, right? We have yeah. to help entrepreneurs get access to other types of capital, help them connect in, and also acknowledge what we can and cannot do and create a community of partners who can help us to achieve um, what we're ultimately all trying to do, um, which is create kind of the African essentially green champions of the world, right? Hmm. Yeah, and related to that, uh, I wanted to have your different point of views on how uh, an agency such, such as Climate Kick can better support uh, the development of the, the different ecosystems uh, around, the, around the continent? How can we better support the entrepreneurs? How can we better support the different entrepreneurship uh, support organization? And how can we better support the investor community? And maybe uh, first I give the word to you, Eunice. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, I wanted to have your perspective on uh, what an agency such as Climate Kick can do to better support the development of um, the climate innovation ecosystems in Africa. Okay, I seem to be having issues. Yeah, I think we can hear you now. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can, we can hear you. The image is okay, a little bit so, blurry, but um, we can hear I, you. I'm not able to hear anybody, unfortunately, for now. Okay. So maybe we can start uh, with the point of view of, uh, of Jade before, and, uh, and uh, we go back to you in, uh, in a minute. Sure. Um, I think there's two important areas that an organization like uh, Essential Climate Kick um, can basically contribute to the development of the overall uh, uh, kind of African clean tech ecosystem. I think one is, as you've already done, right, which is um, creating a connection and a space where local entrepreneurs can actually represent what they're doing, right? Like, if, if you can actually aggregate in and actually effectively take these local entrepreneurs onto a global stage, right? And you can help them to actually tell that kind of compelling story, support them in all of these ways, then the whole world starts to pay attention, right? It's not just us anymore, but now it's everyone who's now looking and realizing that actually there's tremendous opportunity and there's tremendous intelligence and there's tremendous effectively capacity on the continent. And then we can try and tackle that kind of, of, of kind of like an investment gap. I think the other aspect is, you know, um, it, it could potentially be kind of like a little bit of a challenge one, um, but I mean, it's, it's actually access to capital, right? And it's mm -hmm. working with um, all the way up at effectively kind of like the top of the food chain, right? The actual LPs, right? And all of the ones who are perhaps concerned or scared or don't necessarily know how to access Africa or kind of, how to evaluate opportunities in Africa, connecting the men, right, to local investors who can help, right? Um, connecting the men to the opportunities, connecting the men to um, the um, 
all of the kind of like amazing work that is actually being done on the ground through accelerators, through things like that. So um, I think those are kind of the two main things. Um, but yeah, um, this is this is kind of one perspective, and um, I would love to hear others if they're. Perfect. Thank you, Jay. Then just to relate to, uh, to, to that, there is actually another workshop this afternoon that uh, my colleagues from the investment team will be talking about because we are present in that space in Europe and hopefully we will be able to develop that space as well uh, in, the, in the continent. So uh, welcome back, Eunice. Um, are you able to, to speak now? if we could hear your perspective on uh, on this question. Okay, I, I believe you can hear me. So yes. um, the question as to what can um, an organization like Climate Kick do to support entrepreneurs in the wider ecosystem? So from, I'm glad to be speaking from an, um, probably a tried point of view because we have run a program together. So I would, I would, I've been in a position to have done an evaluation of the entire process. And I think this is an opportunity for us to, if we have to continue as we do this, we have to look in the past to be able to create a better future for us. Um, on our part as Zambia, I think through the Impact Hub Rusaka, we realized that uh, these young people were ready for the pitch. They were ready to sell their business ideas and um, they were ready to just start every process. But there was one thing that I noticed. Um, as we are trying to attain a certain level of climate change um, uh, activities, we noticed that the research and development is really just not ripe in Africa. To tell you the truth, these young people get frustrated eventually because these particular activities have not been tested yet. And so you find that all the things that we are talking about, uh, the carbon emission percentage reduction and all those are not measurable because we are not able to have tested them through some serious uh, investment in infrastructure in terms of research and development. And so this innovation becomes uh, frustrated. And once they have that, there's no, there's no appetite for anyone to get into this kind of innovation. So like we indicated earlier, the ecosystem is, is actually fertilized, well fertilized to carry on the agenda of uh, climate change addressing. But the thing is, I think there's a bigger picture. We need to begin to look at other players in the industry. So the uh, financing agencies are coming on board because this is something that everybody is interested in. But then the research and development aspect is still lagging. So if we can manage to do that and bridge that gap, then I know that if we took again a try and a test on the climate launch that kind of activity, we would do a great deal of justice to this because ultimately people are looking for a way of livelihood. Africa is saying with this climate change, how do I still put food on the table? So to address that agenda, we need something that surely brings job creation. We need something that is uh, going to allow us at least to see some kind of uh, impact socially and also to address generally the climate change. So this is what this agenda would look like for me. So you came in with a business idea and agenda. And I would like to inform you, uh, Ayub, and the rest of our viewers and listeners that it was the first kind of Zambia that we took. Everybody is into climate justice. But then when I say climate justice is not bringing food to the table. But when you talk about entrepreneurship in climate change, it becomes very sexy. Everybody else wants to be part of it and, and, and get involved into the activity. So for me, I think it was a great program. It's a great program that would encourage entrepreneurs to take on this and to create an appetite for even more to participate. And it's a sustainable way of having to undertake this agenda. That's what I'll be able to say. I'm sorry I'm not able to get um, the volume, but I, I hope I, I have been clear. Thank you so much. No, that's very clear, uh, Eunice, and, and thank you very much for uh, for your, your your remarks. So thank you everybody for for joining this uh, this session. I think uh, it is time to, uh, to 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 wrap up. Um, so yeah, how to boost climate innovation in uh, in, in Africa? I think uh, all the different panelists here are trying to, uh, to to solve the same the same issue. From climate kick perspectives, our role is actually really to connect these different uh, communities to support 
the innovators, to support the different uh, entrepreneurship support organizations, to support investors, to support governments, so that we really build a thriving ecosystem uh, at, at the end. We see that the potential is huge in the in the continent. Uh, the continent, as we talked about, is suffering a lot from climate change, a lot of different climate risks. And uh, we see that uh, the technology has been uh, d d d developed. We, uh, we see a lot of innovators across the continent tapping into local problems, trying to solve uh, problems on the really smallholder farmers level uh, up to the, 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 the national uh, level. And uh, really to bring all these communities to work together is really the challenge that we all want to, uh, to take. Um, the first steps of building the successful ecosystems have been taken. Uh, the growth of the space uh, has, has took off and it's still uh, growing. So we're really excited to be part of, uh, of, of the journey. Thank you very much to all the panelists who, uh, to, to, to have been here and, uh, and, and discussing with us this, uh, this issue. Um, the Climate Week of Action is still uh, going until Monday, and I would like to invite you for the session that is happening tomorrow around um, uh, climate assessment and how do we assess the, 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 the climate uh, impact for the innovators but as well for the, uh, as for the, uh, the, the investors. Thank you, everybody, and uh, uh, happy to, uh, to, to have all of you uh, in this session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ayub.